Charles making his way up. I'll kind of just uh, introduce myself in the panel here. Uh, my name is Hawk Miller. I'm a sophomore at USC. I'm studying journalism. So I guess uh, the point of today is talking about transitioning from childhood to adulthood. I see a lot of you in the audience are kind of in that age or older. And so I myself have had to adapt a lot uh, based on the challenges that I face with Duchenne. Monsieur Dystrophy. And for example, for college, I've had to think a lot about how I can uh, make everything more accessible for myself, uh, change furniture so I can uh, be able to live in my apartment properly, um, you know, rely on my roommate sometimes to help with uh, some physical stuff, um, uh, organizing extra time on my exams, uh, just for, and writing on a word processor instead of, you know, writing by hand. And also driving is another thing. We were just talking about that here that uh, I've also had to adapt. So I hope you all learned something today about uh, going to the future um, of your adulthood. Okay. And I know everyone else um, is at a different stage in the disease. Um, I know it's variable. So I hope that everyone can benefit in some way from this. So without further ado, we have Jen on the far right here, she is uh, the director of the UC Irvine Disability Center. Uh, then we have Joan Friedlander, who uh, has recently uh, published a book called Business from Bed, the six step comeback plan to get yourself working after a health crisis. And she's also a principal at LifeWork Business Partners, which uh, gives people uh, the opportunity to improve their productivity in the work life. Um, a couple people had great reviews of Joan's book. Uh, one person called it, uh, Joan Friedlanders is a powerful voice to motivate individuals working with health challenges. And so hopefully she'll give some insight into transitioning as she has had some experience in that as well. And then we have Sarada and Kushal here, my left and right, and they uh, moved from Kuwait during your junior year, correct? to Houston, Houston. And now um, you just started his freshman year at UCI. So I think he would have some very good uh, information on transitioning from another country and then into college, um, you know, across the country, so. And I also would like to get everyone um, up to say a little, yeah? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and we have Lori Miller here, uh, the clinical uh, social worker for uh, Children's Hospital LA, uh, the Neuromuscular Clinic, and uh, she's uh, with resources and family needs. I'm really sorry about that. That's okay. Then I'll ask you, the first question I have is, uh, what do you have to offer to the audience today? Oh, okay. Uh, what do I have to offer to the audience? Um, well, I, I, as was said, I am a clinical social worker uh, at Children's Hospital Los Angeles. I also, outside of the hospital work with clients uh, through mindfulness practices, clients who have chronic medical conditions. Uh, I work with them one-on-one -on -one, uh, through yoga, meditation, uh, deep breathing, uh, ways to cope with the feelings and things that come up around transition, but also living with chronic, chronic medical condition. Because I also myself was diagnosed as a child with a chronic medical condition that affects my joints and which is partly why I got into social work. So uh, any support that I can provide to you as family, uh, as parents, uh, please come see me. I would be more than happy to talk to you if you have questions. Uh, my role in the hospital setting at the clinic is to provide the psychosocial support to the families with new diagnosis, uh, also resources, uh, coping, transition is a big one that we talk about. Uh, I get a lot of parents who come in who have a lot of anxiety about the transition from pediatric to adult care, but also what's going to happen when their child goes to college and what support are they going to get, uh, what are the, what's the social, socialization going to be like, how are they going to make, you know, all of that. So that's what I'm here for. And then I guess we can start with Kushal here. What do you uh, feel like you have to talk with Ted here? Uh, firstly, let me like, give a brief introduction about myself. Uh, I'm a freshman at UCI, uh, studying computer science and engineering. Uh, 
uh, I, I was studying in, I was living in Kuwait and I was born and brought up there and I moved to Houston, as he said, in my junior year. Uh, and then, uh, uh, so it was like a huge transition coming from like a different country, different culture, to like uh, change uh, like academically, emotionally, as well as socially, uh, and as well as from uh, high school to, to college. But uh, the entire journey was really possible because of the constant like, support and guidance that I had from my family and my friends and my teachers, all the way from uh, Kuwait, uh, then uh, in Houston, as well as in UCI. Uh, they provided like all the, uh, the accommodation that I need, right from my uh, housing accommodation, as well as testing accommodations for all my quizzes, tests. Uh, and I feel that I can offer my experiences of how I uh, coped with Duchenne muscular dystrophy as well as the transitions that I had uh, from uh, high school to college and I feel that it will provide like insights to how to uh, uh, try to deal with uh, muscular dystrophy. Okay. And Sarada is his mom, if you yeah. wanted to say a few words about what you are as well. Yeah, I'm Kushal's mom, Sharda, and uh, he was diagnosed 2004. Unfortunately in Kuwait we didn't have any medical facilities and back in India so they had written it off, written him off and uh, this was our last hope for us to come to US and know at what stage we had it progressed and it was really a big, uh, I would say a big, big leap for us and it was very informative after coming here. It gave us a lot of hope because uh, after coming here we attended the PPMD and the Kyo Dushin workshops and seeing other children managing their lives and how the parents are coping has also motivated him and given us confidence that yes, he can make this transition to college. And uh, I think we have, in, our, in, the whole, in the process, we have learned how to deal with the whole situation, especially when there's lack of awareness. And uh, though there, we have internet and we read a lot, but dealing with it directly, meeting people and attending workshops like this, definitely helps and I'm really thankful I've come across Kyoto Duchesne and PPMD conferences because I do think they do help a lot meetings and attending such conferences. Definitely gives you a lot of hope and it gives you a lot of courage and confidence to cope with everything in life and how to deal with the children, how to motivate them too. That's what I can share with all of you. Joan, if you want to share a few things about what you can offer to the audience. Sure. Well, I'm a, a, a latecomer to the conversation of chronic illness. I actually did not, I, my, uh, mine is Crohn's disease. I was not impacted by Crohn's until I was 36. Normally people get it between 15 and 35, so I'm a late bloomer. Um, it hit me when I was actually finally <coughs> in my first like in a career that I really loved. I was a bookstore manager and I was a training manager and I had finally found my joy. And um, the first time I was in the hospital, I was offered a promotion. And I said, yeah. And of course, I really didn't know what I was dealing with. Crohn's disease and it's an intestinal illness, bleeding, I mean, it's, it's really gross. So anyway. Um, but what happened is I kept going, I had three jobs inside of my one job and I was um, demoted. So nine months later, they found a new act, new district manager and because I couldn't keep up with my store duties, keeping it, keeping it in good shape, they said, well, you can't have, you know, we need to take you out of this position. And I was really devastated and that set me on a course of about seven years of, you know, in and out of jobs looking for something that would be as rewarding personally and also find a way to manage my health. And um, like I said, it took seven years and then I discovered coaching as a profession and I thought, oh, I, would be, I could be a career coach. I have learned how to navigate transitions and how to find jobs. And so when I started my coaching business, I didn't work in person, I worked on the phone. And the book that I wrote, Business from Bed, um, is literally because there were weeks, days, whatever, where I was, I had to be in bed, in my pajamas, comfortable, like my, you know, my body, and I had to be close to that bathroom, I can still picture it, right across the hall. 
But what was really cool is if with a telephone, a headset, a lap desk, and a laptop, I could work. And what was also remarkable is that during that, those times when I was either, I was leading teleclasses, so I was doing group work, and then I was also coaching people one-on-one. -on -one. My specialty is helping people who are self-employed be successful within their time and available energy. My body disappeared. So even if I was in a flare and I was um, not feeling well that hour or hour and a half when I was on the phone, I forgot. And I think that's the deal with working. If you can find that intersection between something that you enjoy, which I gather you have done, Hawk, and I read your bio, and that you, that you can do within your limited capacity, whatever that might be, and you can get paid for it, that's the other thing, um, then it's worth pursuing because we are here. And if you're, I mean, teens, adults, young adults, I, I mean, and boys especially, I think, you know, I would say you leverage that, um, that little bit of rebelliousness and perhaps see what you can do. And so that's, that's my story and what I offer. I mean, if I, you know, you would ask what I would advise, and I work with people individually, but I guess I would encourage parents and also young adults, if you can, to just find that one intersection. If you have three or four hours a day, figure out what you can do. Great, great. And then, last but not least, we have Janet on what she can offer for everyone today. Hi. Well, I'm hoping that I can provide some uh, information on transition um, from the K-12 system to higher education. My background it was 17 years uh, special education, teaching in K-12, working with students uh, uh, with all kinds of um, handicapping conditions. And then uh, moving on to uh, the last 11 years, I've been at University of California, Irvine as the director of the Disability Services Center. And of course, both systems um, are open and welcoming to um, students with any type of disability but you have to find the right place. And there, you operate under completely different laws in K-12 than you do in higher education. So I'm hoping that I can provide some um, information on those two different systems, um, what to expect as you leave one system and plan to go to another system, what is okay to ask for, what you need to be responsible for, where, where responsibilities change from one system to the next. So hopefully I can provide some um, information in that area. Okay, great. Thank you, everyone. We can open up to questions. So does anyone have anything at the moment for any of our lovely panelists? All right. So that's why I have prepared questions. Um, all right. So I, I go back to Kushal here. Um, so um, what, are, what are some things uh, that other people wouldn't normally see as a challenge that you've had to change. So in other words, um, what, what, what are things that you didn't originally think you were going to have to go up against that you've had to deal with in, in college so far? Uh, maybe like, uh, uh, because, uh, because of my disability, I had to like, find a way to, like with uh, the Christian level of college, to like balance between uh, like doing my therapies as well as managing my classes, homeworks, as well as assignments. How exactly? What are some ways that you've been able to balance all that stuff that you have going on? Uh, I just try to like, uh, like schedule uh, like a time yeah. you know, every day, like like a fixed time to do my therapies. And then, uh, like, uh, because every day there's like a different schedule, so for each day I have like, a different time for my therapies and make sure that, that uh, that's done and I always Make sure that the health is like a first priority and then make sure that I do all my yeah. work on that. Also having fun is good too, right? <laughs> I have yeah. a question. Um, you mentioned that you were working with people with disabilities. Was there a time, I mean, right now our, our son is 14. Uh, having discipline to 
move from being a child where the parent is telling you, you have to do this, you have to do that, did you do this? You know, was there a time when you felt like you gained the discipline to look after yourself and, and manage your own schedule and manage your own doing what you needed to do as an adult? I can uh, take that question first. Um, I think it's a gradual transition. Um, I think uh, during high school, I became a little bit more independent. Uh, my parents wanted to be a little bit more hands-off, um, even though at times they wanted to be very hands-on. <laughs> but I think um, just having that independence where you're still able to fall back on your parents and forget something. But doing that a couple years in advance from college, I think that helps a lot. So by the time you're in college, you know how to manage all your health. Man. I was diagnosed with arthritis as a child, like rheumatoid, all over my body. So uh, I went from a, from being an adolescent, uh, adolescent and then going to college, I went to SC as well um, for undergrad and then got my master's in uh, social work recently. And I, I resonate with this because like there was this process for me as going from uh, the adolescence to then like turning 18 and graduating from high school and then going into college where there was a period of transition of my parents, my dad's a physician so he was also kind of wanted to be hands on, like, you know, very independent and learning to be independent with my care, you know, and and it's been a process but it, but it, as I got older and as I, I moved out here, I went, didn't grow up in LA, I moved from another state, and I just, you know, found my way, you know, and, and people stepped up, like I got support from friends, from uh, people in my faith community, like just started to, look, I had to learn to ask for help, that was the thing, because I was quite independent um, and kind of wanted to deal with it on my own, even with my parents wanting to help, and I found this, this place where I really got to learn to rely on other people, but also rely on my inner my inner resources of you know self esteem and tapping into that and like body image and just everything that comes with having a chronic medical like having a having a disability. I mean, it's like I never wanted to say that word, and I'm like, but it is. I mean, it is okay. It's not my. It's not who I am. And, um, and even with work today, like I have accommodations through Children's Hospital for how I work because I, typing is hard for me. So different things like that. So I don't, I don't know, hopefully that speaks to some of that, but I wanted to share a little bit of what it's been like for me growing up um, and going like years with, with it. If you can have a great life and find your, he, yeah, your, your child will, yeah, it's, um, it's been very powerful to find that. So, I'll, can I, I'll add a, a little bit. Um, when 18 year olds go to college, we treat them as adults. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, they are an adult. But in many ways of maturity, they haven't had the life experiences that we attribute to adults. And so connecting with your disability services center or your DSPNS if you're at a community college is really important. One of the things that uh, we offer at UCI is we work with organizational skills, time management skills, how to talk to faculty, how to, how to um, get involved in clubs, how to speak up, how to self-advocate for yourself. So if you're fortunate enough to have um, those experiences going through high school where you have the opportunities to um, to um, be a good self-advocate, that is fantastic. But not every person going into higher ed is going to have had those experiences. And so connecting with the Disability Resource Center is really important and um, uh, helping to uh, learn how to manage um, course schedules, doctor's appointments, clubs and organizations, get-togethers with friends, all of those things are a part of college life. And it's overwhelming for every first year coming to campus. 
every single one, it's overwhelming. And they, everyone wants to do either way more than they can possibly do, or they don't do very much and they end up feeling isolated and lonely. So, so there is support on campuses for some of the things that you're talking about because, like I said, we, we view students as adults, but they don't come with all the adult life skills that we would like to see magically appear when they leave home. I'd just like to add one point to what you asked. Uh, yes, as parents, we do tend to tell them that to do this and do that, and somewhere it does inculcate, and sometimes I just let him go, let him make his mistakes because they learn from their mistakes. So it remains etched in his mind the next time, okay, this is where I lapsed, and I tell him back, okay, now can you suggest, so he comes forward, and can we discuss, and can we brainstorm, and do you offer? So I feel we can guide them if we let them free a little bit, and then, you know, so, once he makes, they have the liberty to make mistakes and learn from them, I feel that way. So I have given him that independence and said that you have to be independent because growing up in Kuwait, it is a very small country and it's like, it's totally they have to depend on us whether we go out, whether my husband has to take us out, my husband has to drop them everywhere. Anything, we, you know, just like a cocoon life we had lived. So I feel coming out to this place was the best decision for him and I've been able to train him to be independent and he's trying to manage by himself, by himself most of the things and take his own decisions like coming to UCI and now I feel that's the right fit college for him. We have been to all the campuses, and to different campuses and then different disability services and uh, we did a lot of research before we could think of you know zeroing on one particular college but the ultimate call was this. So these decisions we let him make so that he can be independent and if this is his choice, he'll work towards that. And that's what I think. So, Kushal, how valuable was it for you to visit campuses? Yeah, it was really valuable for me to, to actually like, uh, because even when you read like in the website, only when you actually go there and actually like, like see it for yourself, uh, do you uh, know whether it's like some of your feeling when you go somewhere, if it's actually uh, like right fit for you or not. So. Uh, so that's why I, uh, uh, I, I went like to the different campuses and somehow felt that UCI was the best choice for me. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm a Trojan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, there's a lot of Trojans here, I'll, I guess. <laughs> I'll also just speak from the social work perspective and the, the uh, young adults, adolescents, young adults as they're getting older. I, I share with them too, sometimes I saw, I disclose and I say, listen, you know, I had to sometimes learn the consequences of not taking my medication or not doing, and it sucked in the moment, outward. it's not so great. Um, but it, it also, I, I felt like it, it comes onto a level I can relate, you know, it's like sometimes you just want to be normal. And, um, and from the social work, and we are normal, but I just mean, you know, not have these things that we have to do, like go to the doctor and take medication and do this and do that and constantly keep all this stuff. And, um, and I really start early with them. Like, I, start, I try to start around 17, 18, just well, what are you doing? How, do you know your medications? Do you know your doses? Practice calling the pharmacy. Like, I start empowering them at a very young age in the clinic because it, it it's scary when you're like suddenly thrown into that and you're kind of going like, well, I mean, I know right. it's for me. set, up, set up for failure. Right, yeah. so I really work with, with mm, the patients, the, the kiddos, to set them up for success and also help the parents, like set, set you all up for success in terms of how to work as a team um, and find that balance between, yes, giving some independence, but also being, being that, you know, net if, the, if they need to come, come home and say, how would I do, you know, help. Um, Support. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, we need to move on. Yeah. We don't have that much time. <laughs> so, I have questions. Yes. <laughs> so, interesting, um, you know, in, in counseling, so, so we're talking about transition, like from high school to college, uh -huh. and from, from pediatric to adult care and all that. It's also, you know, they have to be thinking and step beyond that in terms of their career. And what, you know, given each particular disability and the nuances for that one, you know, um, and anticipating that, you know, how can these kids um, 
start pointing the direction they're going to in their education early on so that they can you know get the internship so that they can come out of it knowing what's appropriate for them well i this is my view of course but um i would this is <laughs> i actually kind of failed in college for a moment and took a break and when i went back uh, I decided because because I I'm kind of looking at long you know the long term view and there's shorter term view and college is designed or at least when I went to college that you go and you go to get a career and I would say that is possible but I would also encourage a young adult to look at well, what are you really interested in because it's if what you're really interested in is what lights you up and if um, and if it can turn into a career I mean I was a psychology major it took a long time for me to really use this degree I'd say in coaching I now use it um, so I always had an interest in my, my actually in high school I decided and I think you know I've encouraged uh, parents and or young adults to look at well what do you what do you seeing what's your purpose and so mine was I had a belief that people could find that people could have the right to do work they really enjoyed and my parents said ah, good luck with that so you know it was a battle for me um, and with my longevity and looking back that spark carried through to my different careers that I have had. And um, some people, like I have known people, like I knew somebody who knew he wanted to be an architect in eighth grade. Not everybody knows that. <coughs> and so look as far out as you can see, make the best determination that you can, pursue it until and if it changes. So I'm, I'm actually not personally that focused on you must identify the one because not everybody can do that. Can I jump in on that a little bit? Before you start, I just wanted to interrupt a little bit. When uh, an audience member asks a question, can you guys repeat it so the camera could be Did I miss Okay. You're, you're fine, but just for next time. <laughs> <laughs> so you mentioned um, preparing for a career and internships. Um, and about four years ago, we had the opportunity of having Temple Grandin come um, to campus um, and uh, spend some time with the students um, who at UCI who identify as having um, autism or Asperger's syndrome. And she had a one-on-one a -on -one session with a group of about 15 or 20 students. And one of the questions she asked them is, what job experience have you already had? What are you doing right now? What chores do you have? Where are you volunteering? Um, what part-time job uh, can you get while you're here? Because as you were saying, it is really difficult to know what career you want to go into. Um, many of our uh, majors at at our universities have internships or practicums or clerkships that are associated with the major and so they get an opportunity to get out and actually do some real world experience but if that's in their senior year and they don't like it when they get out there I mean that's almost too late so so finding ways to have um, uh, part-time jobs, career opportunities, volunteerism, all through high school and even while you're in college is really important. Mm -hmm. And there are great um, um, aptitude assessments, discovery assessments that students can take when they get to the university, when they're at the community college, to help them hone in on, on those areas that are valuable to you and that you're passionate about. Um, I would never have known about becoming a special education teacher, um, actually it was between social work and special education. I was just like, I couldn't decide which major I was gonna go to. And I took one of these tests and it just, 
I mean, just clearly lined out all the things that were my preferred activities. And so it really helps to make decisions um, by getting some good experience, uh, volunteering, and, and doing those um, internships that are available while you're in college. May I add to that or re what? Yeah, so experience sometimes is what, how people figure out what they want. And the book, you know, I mentioned that I found coaching. The book that helped me find it is a book called Do What You Are. It's, a, it's, it's based on the Myers-Briggs assessment. And it's one of the rare books that I could actually use myself and take myself through and figure out what my personality type. And then it gives this menu of, of different career ideas for that particular type. And so I essentially responded to that. So I appreciate that you're in the system and you are currently aware of the tools. And um, it's just that it's another avenue. And yeah, it's sometimes you don't know. You have to use experience to inform you. Okay. I want to go back to Michelle here. Um, there's a lot of things that are hard uh, uh, to accommodate, but there's a lot of things that are awesome about being in college that's really fun. I just wanted to kind of talk to you about what, what in your opinion, what's the best part about being independent and moving away to college? Uh, I feel like the best part about uh, like moving to college is that uh, like you're open to like different opportunities uh, and you have a, like a chance to like explore the things that you never thought that you could do or you, because like there are many things that are out there that I never thought that I might have like an interest in. I just like try it and try to explore it, and I feel like I like I liked it. That's one of the things. Mm -hmm. And kind of going off that, sorry, um, what has been something that's easier to deal with than you thought of with and being away? Um, easier to deal with, I think, is at least I'm happy that she's getting independent. But that's the main yeah. aim. That it's what we aim that she should be emotionally and. Physical dependence is still there, mm -hmm. but because uh, being an international student, he doesn't, yeah. you know, he doesn't get any nurse or caregiver or something which we have to pay out of our own, which is quite uh, exorbitant yeah. because it almost costs twenty or uh, twenty dollars an hour or something a pounder. So that's way way far too expensive beyond that. Yeah. So, but at least I want him to be emotionally independent and gradually physical independence as far as he can manage his own activities. Yeah. Well and good, but as in other things, I didn't think that an independent. But I'm glad that he's able to manage him manual. I mean, he negotiates and he goes on himself by himself. He knows what he has to ask from his faculty, what are the resources, how to use them on the campus. So those things, and he also, uh, it's a, like a human management. You can say most yeah. of the management course that they're doing when they book for you. Know, we have, we don't have transport, so he books for the access and write access, he has to contact them, he books for them, then he does all his therapies, he has fixes up the sessions, everything. I'm just with the background as a caregiver, yeah. and just that's, that's mainly the physical grooming and for the feeding and the other assistance for the therapies and all that. So I guess uh, off that, this could be for both of you. What's been something that's been really difficult that you've been able to overcome and kind of share how you've been able to overcome it, so if any of these other people are in, they can do it too. Yeah. The most difficult thing I think can be. Yeah, repeat, yeah. yeah. I think if you can, if you want to tell first. Yeah, okay, yeah. You want to repeat the question? Yeah, okay. So for me, uh, what I felt was like the most difficult thing was uh, like before I live in Kuwait. So I, uh, actually, I feel like the problem, I, like when I was small, I didn't actually like like properly like understand like the weightage of the problem until I had like until like my walk, like my walking like slowly like used and I started like frequent falls. Uh, and when I like stopped walking, only then I like actually realized it. So I feel like the, uh, but then I felt like after I moved from, because in Kuwait they they, they were they didn't even give me like much hope. So I felt like after I moved here, like my outlook has changed, especially like uh, like seeing uh, how people here are managing. And, uh, so that like motivates me to to improve myself and feel optimistic. The biggest challenge for me, I feel, is you know 
handling the emotional aspect. There are times when I see his frustration and he has a lot of potential and he has a lot of dreams to do so many things and there are times when I see his frustration and he don't help this. So that you know that is when I turn and I turn towards faith and my prayers and I you know I try to tap my own inner strength and I just pray and that's what helps me to go. That is the biggest challenge and What do you think is the, mo the, resor the most common resource that's underutilized or missed out on by the families with Duchenne that you think they could take advantage of? Uh, I think that the one that I, <coughs> I encourage, okay, the, most, the most underutilized, let me repeat the question, the most underutilized resource I, that I find, based on the population that I work with at Children's, it's a lot of them. Um, aren't even aware of the muscular dystrophy. It's like I, when I tell them, like there's a foundation. I mean, this is the particularly with the population I'm working with is that the the support from other families. I, that's that's the one that I encourage families. I say, you want go to go to someone who gets like the and that's through the foundation through. Uh, a parent, men, you know, parent to parent, connecting parents. That's that's the one that I find. I think a lot of the parents that I come across, um, they think they have to do it all by themselves, and they come to me and they, you know, especially in the new the new diagnosis, they are overwhelmed and they don't know where to go and where do I get the support? And I uh, and once they start hooking up with other families and connecting with the resource that they just there's like this relief and this light that comes back that I see and that's I think the one that's the most so how um, would someone go about finding one of these families if there isn't any in their area um, well a lot of times I will work with uh, the physician uh, in our clinic and we will think of okay, what family might be a good fit in terms of connecting and then we ask each family, is it okay if we exchange? I mean, right now that's how, how it is. What I ideally would like to set up as a program in the clinic is uh, like a parent, parent partner program where I link parents to parents um, within the, the, uh, the patients that are at the hospital and like Spanish speaking versus English speaking, you know, so they can really be a, a source of support for Okay. So I want to encourage to me that you know the focus is not okay. We talk about the transition for the young person, and it's a transition for the parents as well. And I don't know what resources are there. That's not my ballpark. But um, it occurs to me that parents need as much support as the kids do. For this time, and I heard I I um I went to the Global Genes Summit, and I attended the transition program there, and they were talking about starting the transition plan, both medically as well as future looking, just generally um, at about age 13, mm -hmm. and um, 
one other thing. Oh, and then I didn't know this, and I don't know how many of you live in California, but apparently there's this really great program, which name I don't have on top of mind right now, that at the vocational level, that um, will work with young adults with disabilities to set goals, identify employers who might be friendly, and to really and to set goals within their capacity. And I didn't. I didn't even, you know, to your point about asking for help, it never occurred to me to utilize such a thing, but I asked the woman at the end if I might have actually qualified, and she said yes, so it was just less evident to me, but I just wanted to put that out as a resource, and I don't remember the name of it. Yeah. Somebody probably does. Yeah, probably, yeah. Yeah, so. it's that you bring up, like, asking for help, that's something that, yeah. I've, had to, that I've had to get over as well. Um, you, you feel like you're you should be able to do all this on your own, but you really can't, and you need other people to help you. I think that's a big takeaway. It's such a fine line, though, because mm -hmm. I guess George is 14, and he was having everything done for him on mm -hmm. his mother. Things that he could have done. Mm -hmm. And so that was something that we tried to get away from, tried to challenge him a little bit, you know? So it's like, you know? That's okay. well, well, I ain't even watching my parents. Like, I have so much empathy for my parents now. I mean, when you're an adolescent, you're like, nah, you know. <laughs> but um, I have so much respect and admiration and empathy for and compassion for my parents watching their child with, with like, sick, you know, in, in hospitals and having surgery and, and on meds and, and it is a balancing act. That's what I, I yes, it, they, it's trial and error. And sometimes I was like, Argh. and then other times, you know, I need your help. And it just, it wasn't a linear experience at all. It's not linear. It's like A to Z to B to D, you know. And then you find the groove and you find your new normal. And and that was my experience with it, with my parents. I think having the sibling, he has an older brother. So the bonding with him, so that also helps a lot for them to, you know, to talk. They have emotional bonds, so they do discuss things and they you know, talk about common interests and they share a lot. So that also helps a lot to you know, cope with everything. Yeah, I just want to ask if anyone else has any more questions at this point. Um, for, for the uh, Department of um, the Disability Services, um, so my son is going to go to community college next year, um, and he has been interacting with that, that office for a while now, but do you do that, I mean, so I know it's different than like an IEP for, for K through 12, so, but is there something similar that you use as like a document that kind of helps guide the, the process of them making a plan for themselves? But the educational plan? Like something, yeah, yeah, at the college level. Do so, you guys do that? So, yes and no. So, in K-12, you're talking about the IEP process, and in higher ed, we transfer over to the um, 504 process, which is completely different than it is in K-12. And when we look at um, determining what accommodations might be appropriate for a student at UCI or USC or um, any higher ed. We look at the diagnosis. We look at the limitations that the individual experiences. But we also put um, a huge stock in what the student tells us. So. Um, if I had met with Kushal, which I did not, um, I would have had a conversation with him, you know, tell me, you know, what you're worried about, tell me what, you know, you've been around campus, what are you, what do you see happening, um, talk to me about your hands, your legs, your everything, and, um, and then we look at, okay, how can I remove as many barriers as possible? Because that's my job, removing barriers. <clears throat> but I don't know if there's a barrier unless somebody's told me. A, a, a piece of paper with a diagnosis isn't going to tell me about a barrier. And so, um, and sometimes you have to engage early. Um, 
Is it okay if I no. use you a little bit? No, no, Kishaw? No, no. Kishaw was very, <clears throat> very proactive. Contacted us months before um, he knew he was going to be coming to UCI. And we talked about things. Well, I didn't, but <clears throat> others talked to him about not only about classes and, and um, uh, test accommodations and, and getting around campus and accessibility in and out of um, classrooms, but also housing. Most of our students live on campus, and it's, mm -hmm. it's not your parents' home, and everything was all fixed and nice. Well, when a student moves in, we have to now take that unit and make sure that it's perfect for that student. Um, had we had one already, he would have got it, but someone else beat him to that last one. So, so that communication is just so important. Being proactive is so important. And um, understanding the barriers. Once we understand that, we're open about that, then we can do what we need to do on the university side to allow Kushal or any student to do what everybody else gets to do. And that's really our goal. So there is, um, with all that said, um, there is a, the 504 plan that you, you, you created together as kind of a guiding document. I guess, like, I'm thinking my son, I'm, re I'm ready for him to be a parent and everything, but I know he struggles with organization, and I just, mm -hmm. I just wonder, it helped me as a parent have sure. an IEP, so. Right, so we don't have a 504 plan. What we do is we have a 504 process. So that process is having that conversation, that very interactive conversation, and quite frequently it involves family members. Um, but once we have that plan, the plan, or that uh, conversation, the 504 plan, which is not a 504 plan mm -hmm. like you're used right. to, is a set of accommodations. And, and then the student is allowed to use those accommodations um, however the student feels um, best to use them. Can I ask you a question? <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, I went to Berkeley, and, and, and definitely that campus and the support systems were set up for people with a variety of, of certainly physical disabilities, because that's what I could see. Is it you, would you say that, I mean, part of visiting campuses is they're not all the same. So that might be part of the investigative process. And that's why I actually asked Kushal, how valuable was it to visit a campus? Because campuses are beautiful, they, they have their own personality, they have the majors, not every campus has the same major, so you kind of have to limit it to those where it has the major that you think you want. But what is it to navigate that campus? Are the buildings from 1920 and, and you can't and they don't everything has a stair and in order to get into the building you have to go all the way around the back of the building you know I mean you have to look at these things and that's why a, a campus visit is so valuable um, and not just a two-hour campus tour I mean a real visit I'm, I'm sure uh, going to SC was um, a very exploratory experience for you, Hawkins. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because a lot of the buildings are from like, the 1800s. <laughs> and um, you kind of have to figure that out. A lot of times, you know, I wasn't prepared. Like, there would be something I had to contact, like, the facilities to, like, figure it out. But um, it's kind of... Automatic door's not working today. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, another thing is a lot of, the, a lot of buildings don't even have automatic doors. So you have to be willing to ask people to help them knock and sometimes obnoxiously knock on them. <laughs> but um, yeah, I was kind of planning on ending around now. I'm sure everyone's hungry if they want food. Um, I just add to that because we have been to almost about eight, nine campuses, right from Texas, Austin, to Berkeley, to San Diego, UCLA, and so many other campuses. We've been to Washington, Seattle, because we already got admissions. So we liked Washington, he liked Washington, Seattle, but the rain, you know, we had so many other factors, the climate, and you know, the way he can move around with the campus. This is big enough, and at the same time, it's compact enough for him to go between one class to another. And uh, there were some places like 
we like uh, Texas Hospital is good, but then it's too spread out and it's almost on the road. So, I mean, there's a safety factor. And then if there's an emergency, it is here I know there is a hospital I can run to. But what about, you know, certain places, where do we take him? And how do we come from Kuwait? It takes 24 hours or 28 hours for us to come from there to here. So if there's an emergency, you know, there's, there's so many factors which played into, a, you know, which can be considered before we could zero in on this one. And he liked the campus and he felt very nice after coming. So that, that was the main reason why he was, he was very keen that, we, had, we were also very keen that we should talk. As he said, virtual tour is something different from the internet. Everything looks beautiful, all the campus. Mm -hmm. But when you go there, you actually see the ground reality and that makes a lot of difference. That should be the main factor, I think. You know. Besides the course content, for him it was climate also which mattered because he's not used to cold climates. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. That's a wrap.